So I want to take a moment here before I read the scripture and bring the message just to say thank you for being the church that you are. You, you are such a loving and caring congregation. Every time we've had a death or a loss in the church this past year, I've seen how you have reached out and just loved and cared for our congregation. And we saw it again on Friday when our church lost Don Pittman. He was here the week before, passed away during the week. And the way that you showed up with food and hugs and warmth and hospitality to their family, it was inspiring to me. We had people who were here from Texas and Oklahoma and Missouri and other parts of the country, and they kept saying to me, David, your church is so warm and so friendly, and your hospitality is amazing. It's one of the things that, you know, we all say every church we hope is warm and friendly and welcoming, but really it's true when we talk about this church. One of the things I, I, I truly value about Harvard Avenue is that Harvard Avenue really is a place that places emphasis upon relationships. Because we really do believe that we grow in our relationship with Christ as we embrace one another in relationships of grace and concern. It's for this reason that we have been working really hard as a staff to put together a plan to take our church to a new place this new season. After this 18 months of being apart, we're going to be creating new opportunities for group and education classes. And it's a whole new design for us. We're going to ask you to get involved in some way to pray for the effort. But for that to happen, to facilitate that, we're going to be changing our worship schedule on Sunday mornings. On August 8th, we'll have a 9 o'clock service, and this service will be at 1030. We'll have a half hour in between for coffee, donuts, and fellowship, and our classes are going to take place at 9 and at 1030. And for those of you who are actively involved in a class, you're going to hear from your group leader whether your group or class will meet at 9 or 1030. Children's Wonder Worship and Youth Worship at 9, and then 1030 will be uh, children's Sunday school and also worship. It's, it's a significant change for us, but what I think is really the right time for us to do this, and we just hope that every one of you are going to invite others to be a part, a part of that. So thank you for being who you are. Are you ready for a message? I'm excited today. I'm excited uh, to bring the fourth message uh, in our series on 1 Samuel chapter 30 today. This is a story that I think is undervalued and underappreciated and often unknown. It's one of my favorite stories. Today we will find David at the very worst moment in his life up to this point. <laughs> Things don't go well from here on. But in this story, David does respond well. He responds with grace under pressure. And it's interesting, we're going to hear the story about what happens at this place called the Brook Brazor. Bazor, Bazor. I didn't say Brazier, I said Bazor. <laughs> and Bazor is actually a word that means gospel, it means glad tidings. So here's the scripture. I'm not going to read the whole story, but part of it, and I'll tell the rest of it myself. Chapter 30, 1 Samuel. Three days later, when David and his men arrived home at their town of Ziklag, they found that the Amalekites had, ra had made a raid into the Negev and Ziklag. They had crushed Ziklag and burned it to the ground. They had carried off the women and children and everyone else, but without killing anyone. When David and his men saw the ruins and realized what had happened to their families, they wept until they could weep no more. Uh, David's two wives, Ahinoam, from Jezreel, and Abigail, the widow from the Nabal, of Nabal, from Carmel, were among those captured. And David was now in great danger because all his men were very bitter about losing their sons and daughters, and they began to talk of stoning him. But David found strength in the Lord his God. But David found strength in the Lord his God. Then he said to Abathar, the priest, bring me the ephod. 
So Abathar brought it, and then David asked the Lord, should I chase after this band of raiders? Will I catch them? And the Lord told him, yes, go after them. You will surely recover everything that was taken from you. So David and 600 men set out, and they came to the brook Bezor. But 200 of the men were too exhausted to cross the brook, so David continued the pursuit with 400 men. Would you pray with me? Holy and gracious God, thank you for this word that we've heard today. And we pray that you would stir a passion within us today, an affection for you, to turn to you in this wilderness world we live in, to receive your grace that we may be a people of grace. In Jesus' name, all God's people did say. David spent uh, the enti an entire decade in his 20s in the wilderness. He had a price on his head. He was an outlaw. He was on the run. He was a fugitive, hunted like an animal. David was anointed at a young age to be the new king of Israel. And David had great successes early on. He married the king's daughter, became a prince and son-in-law of the king. Everything he touched turned to gold, killed a giant, led the Israeli army against the Philistines and had one success after another. And because of it, David grew in popularity. People loved him. People rallied around David. But compared to David, Saul was a difficult person. Saul was uh, jealous and envious. Uh, given to be temperamental and moody and often violent and had fits of rage. And as David grew in power and influence, he became more of a threat to the king. And so as a result, David had to spend all this time moving from place to place in the desert region of the Negev, a very desolate place to live. He moved from place to place over a decade. But David did not live alone in the desert. David was surrounded by a whole company of unusual people, ragamuffins, misfits, losers, the marginalized from the world at that time. This is what it says. It says in 1 Samuel chapter 22, it says, the people who gathered around David were men who were in trouble or in debt or who were just discontented. And over that decade, the numbers grew and grew and grew. They ate together. They survived together. They prayed together. They worshiped together. And they fought together. What they did was, in that wilderness, this community surrounded by David created an oasis, an oasis of life for themselves. Now that's relevant. I want you to underline this point. Because in some sense, is that not what we are doing here as a church? Isn't it true that we have gathered around Jesus in the wilderness of the world we live in, just like those men, women, and their families gathered around David? We live in this world that's unpredictable and can be unsafe and uncomfortable and harsh. And so we have joined Jesus, who is out in the wilderness of this world, the incarnate Son of God at work in this world, and we've gathered around this table to be his people, to do life together. That's how Jesus' ministry began. He left the wilderness, lived in the wilderness, preached in the wilderness, taught in the wilderness. His first sermon was, I have been anointed to bring good news to the poor, to the desolate, the disconnected, the captives, to set people free, to give sight to the blind. And all throughout his ministry, all kinds of people gathered around him, an uncommon gathering of people, the sick, the desolate, the disappointed, the discontented, the Gentile, the Jew, the loser, the left out, Anyone and everyone, the rich and the poor, gathered around Jesus and they ate together and they lived together, they prayed together, and they did life together. 
You know, this week as I was preparing this message, I walked around our building, and all around our building you will find passages of Scripture that have been etched in stone or prayers or have been uh, written on plaques in classroom walls. It's in our stained glass. It's everywhere in our building. But on the one main wall that faces Harvard Avenue, you'll read these words from Matthew chapter 11. This is the face of our building to the community. And it says here, Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Because we know how life is. You make your plans, and then life has other plans. It was true when Jesus was preaching and teaching, and it's true now. And to all of us and to everyone, as he did then, as he does now, he says, come to me. Come to me, and I will give you rest. So, if you're discouraged, if you're scared, if you don't have a place to belong, if you're sick, if you're hurting, if your kids are just a wreck. You know, if you get mad at small things and you sweat the small stuff, if you're not sure what you believe, you're not sure you believe anything at all, you're not sure there's a God at work in this world, you're not sure how to pray, you don't think you're holy, you don't feel like you fit in, you don't think you belong to church, Jesus just says, come. Bring your burdens, bring your weary hearts, gather around me in the wilderness. Now let me say this to you, church. These next 10 years, the last 10 years, this 18 months we've just been through have been hard on the church. The church has tried to do the same thing over and over again, expecting different results, but we've got results we didn't want. I'm, not, I'm talking about every church. The church has lost influence in our culture. Our culture is going through major changes and shifts, and we can't all agree on what those shifts and changes are. So the answer for the church to bring the gospel of Jesus to the world is not a strategic plan. It is not a program. It's not a new website. It's not a marketing technique. It's not a beautiful building. It's not great music. Sorry, Kelly. It helps. It's answering the call of the one who calls us. I really believe that in the world, Jesus is saying to his church, come to me. Will you just come to me? Bring your burden to me, church, and listen to me. Now, this story I just read about speaks to this community that we live in, in this wilderness. David's been doing life with these people for a long time, and then David makes a terrible decision, the worst decision of his life up to this point. The king of the Philistines has given Ziklag to David and his men. They worked out a truce. He, he's living there with his men and their families, and they've made their home there in the desert. But David has taken his men away, his army away, his soldiers away from, from their base of operation, have left it unprotected. And while they were three days away, the Amalekite army raids the town and burns everything to the ground. Imagine you've been away, and all you want is just to sleep in your own bed. All you want to do is hug your children. All you want to do is kiss your spouse. All you want to do is have a good home-cooked meal. You can't wait to get home. And as you're walking through the desert, you see smoke rising. And then when you get there, your fears are confirmed. Everything is in ruins and your wife and children have been taken away captive. Have you ever been in a place in life where you wept till you could weep no more? Have you ever been so broken that you could not be 
broken anymore. And it says in this situation that David's men turned on him for the first time. They went from despair to blame to anger to murder. A little bit earlier today, somebody walked up to me and said, David, I moved through all those stages this morning when I came to worship. I moved from despair to blame to anger. And then he looked at me and he said, murder. Because when I got here this morning, there was no coffee and donuts. (laughs) You notice I work donuts into the worship service every week. It was a desperate situation. Let me ask you, what would you you do if you were in David's situation? What do you do when you're confronted by animosity and hate and anger and you know that you are responsible and at the same time you're grieving for your own children? What do you do? One of the best lines in the whole Bible here is because David had a heart for God. It says that David did what David often did when he found himself in a desperate situation. It says that he turned to God and he strengthened himself in the Lord. You could also translate it to say that David got his heart encouraged by the Lord. You see, David, he... He had such great leadership skills. He had vision. He had passion, charisma, faith, and courage. But in this moment, David was at the bottom of himself, and he knew that none of his gifts were going to get him where he needed to be. Why is it that sometimes we make a huge mess of our lives that we are so reluctant to ask for help? Why is it that we think that if we have made a mess of things, that we will somehow or another have the answer to things? The Bible does not say anywhere in it, God helps those who help themselves. It does say, God helps those who place their trust in God and lean not on their own understanding. Fortunately, Psalm 18 like all the psalms, were written during those desert years. And this psalm is recorded in 2 Samuel, but also in Psalms. And here David, it says, the the heading above it says, David wrote this after he'd been rescued from his enemies and from Saul. So it could have been written at any time. It could have been written after this. But it reflects where David is at this moment. David in the crosshairs is at this moment writes, I love you, Lord. You are my strength. The Lord is my God, my fortress, and my Savior. My God is my rock in whom I find protection. He is my shield, the power that saves me in my place of safety. I called on the Lord who is worthy of praise, and he saved me from my enemies. The ropes of death entangled me. Floods of destruction swept over me. The grave wrapped its ropes around me. Death laid a trap in my path, but in my distress I cried out to the Lord. Yes, I prayed to my God for help, and God heard me. My cry to God reached God's ears. Now, from that, I take three or four things. Now, I want to tell you, these things are really simple. Sometimes I think we make things too complicated. But simple is good if you do it. So you look at David and you can see what David did. It's simple and anyone can do it. But we don't do it. It says that in this moment what David did, David did what we could all do when we find ourselves in a crisis in the wilderness. And these speak to the church too right now, okay? This is corporately and individually. The first thing David did when he was faced with this crisis was he spent time with God to get perspective. 
to hear another voice, to get quiet. And then David did what we could all do, which was David asked for help. The author of 1 Samuel is trying to compare here intentionally David with his men. When David's men are confronted with the crisis, what do they do? They blame and point fingers and get angry. But David turns to God. It's also a comparison between David and Saul because in this whole cycle of this whole story, Saul is also being threatened. Saul is being threatened by the Philistines. And what does Saul do? Saul confronts, uh, consults a medium who brings Samuel back from the dead. This is a good story. Read it too. But Samuel comes back from the dead and goes, what are you doing Bring me back from the realm of the dead? He goes, I need some help. Too late now, buddy, he says, you're going to die. And it says in the story that Saul passes out and faints and is paralyzed in fear. But David, because he consults with God, is not paralyzed in fear, but instead gets up and moves. And the last thing is that he gives grace to those who can't. That's the rest of the story. So what happens is they charge, they march out for, you know, 15 miles. They've wept till they can weep no more. They're exhausted, they're tired, they're, they're beat down. They have been traveling for three days and they get to Brook Bazaar. And 200 can't go on. Now, can you imagine what the 400 men are thinking that march on? They can't fight for their families? Can you imagine how tired and exhausted you have to be where you can't take another step, even if it means saving your family? They are so beaten down, they can't move. David goes on, and David meets an Egyptian a man dying in the desert. They feed the man. They give the man water. The man, out of gratitude, directs them to their wives and their children and the Malachites. They have a decisive victory. And David recovers everything. Their wives and their children and their property and their possessions. And can you imagine the celebration that took place back at the Brook Bazaar? Can you imagine families reuniting the success, the celebration, the hugs, the tenderness, and the kisses. But that's not the end of the story. Because 400 of the men said, you can have your wives and children back, but not your stuff. Because you didn't do the work. You're undeserving. But David who received grace from God again and again and again, says, no, everyone will receive what is theirs because everything we have is a gift from God and we can't withhold it from anyone. And we see the magnificence of David's heart in that moment that from this troubled heart that's filled with all these different things, because David has received grace upon grace upon grace from God, now David gives grace to these 200. You got to know that every Sunday we gather here, there's some that can't take another step. You got to know as we march out in the future, there are going to be people who can't move forward. You got to know in the world we're living in right now, some of us think the pandemic's over, but there's some of us that are still wanting to stay behind because they're worn out and tired. They've lost loved ones. And we just want to move on as if nothing happened. David says, Grace, that the foundation for those who are living in the wilderness is not doctrine our ideology, our politics, our good deeds, our strategies, that the foundation of community living together in the wilderness is grace. And we see David give grace to the men who were angry and bitter, who wanted to kill him. We see him give grace to the Egyptian, and now we see him giving grace to these 200 who were left behind. Friends, I want to tell you something. 
if we want to make an impact on this world, because I believe we do, I don't think this is a church that just wants to sit and look at the world from behind stained glass while the whole world shrinks around us in fear and hate. I think that we want to do something. I don't think we want to just be an extension of a country club. I think we want to be a church that brings the gospel to the world. If we're going to do that, folks, we've got to understand what is the best thing that we have to offer. It is the love and forgiveness and the grace that is ours in Jesus Christ to be the church that lives its creed that says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. I will give you rest. And so David shows us. Spend time with God. Ask for help. Get up and move. And grace for all. You know what? I see it in you. 